I'm not sure where he's at, but I want to introduce the one and only William Gilmore Weber, guitarist extraordinary. He's a legend. Believe it or not, this guy has <laughs> one hell of a history. Hey, man, thanks for being here, dude. No problem. Cincinnati, Ohio, by the way, is uh, where my butt is at right now. <laughs> I, I, wasn't there a band? Am I wrong? Was there a band from there or was it a different part of Ohio called the legendary Pink Dots? That, they were from Cleveland. Um, Cleveland. Yeah, I only saw them once, and I think they came down like a big school bus, and they played this club, and they uh, brought, they found like all this pink styrofoam, and they just like at the end they brought it all out, and the you know the owner was pissed because they left right after that without picking any of it up. It was it was a great show. I mean, you know, pink styrofoam no. doesn't sound like much, but uh, there was just so much of it everywhere, and there was just like a surprise. So, yeah, those guys just popped up in my head for some weird reason. But you, you've been <laughs> involved with bands like the Candy Snatchers, Sugar Shock, the Brass Knuckle Boys, Human Zoo, the Chrome Cranks, the Murder Junkies. Jesus, man. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> which, of those, which of those was your actual? Is your favorite band uh, upon reflection? Oh, um, well, Human Zoo was good because, like, nobody heard of us or whatever. Uh, we were just a little Cincinnati band that maybe played 10 times. And, uh, you know, uh, it was like Stooges kind of sounding stuff. And around here, uh, there was nothing like that going on at the time, mid, mid 80s. So uh, we got popular, but then we were all <laughs> a bunch of alcoholics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just the band <laughs> couldn't get it together. And uh, so, you know, uh, it was fun. It was like my first band, my first like real band, first band recorded and all that stuff and uh yeah it was it was wild um and like it's weird because like the singer his name was bevo um his real name is steve ruja but somehow when he was a kid he got the name bevo and he was like this really like wild uh hippie kind of guy long blonde hair he looked a lot like iggy he had like the same frame of course he just like wear you know um uh, just like something to cover up himself uh and like <laughs> often that was pulled down like during the shows i played with like two naked singers which <laughs> i don't know if many people could say that <laughs> that's hilarious we're yeah. definitely we're gonna get to your time with Gigi, but i've got to ask about the chrome cranks you mm -hmm. guys are known, known as like a very legendary band a lot of people really really love you guys um are you still with those guys uh no uh i am currently uh in another band with pete the singer uh he's he lived in Cincinnati for a long time he's originally from new jersey uh he moved here in his high school days and uh we hooked up and uh became friends and uh he started playing guitar and we formed uh Chrome Cranks. I think Chrome Cranks is the first band <laughs> he played guitar and he played i don't know if you've heard of sluggo they were a hardcore band from yep. here, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I he, remember. Like, yeah, uh, he was uh, he was with them, and uh, he was also in a band in Jersey called Sand in Your Face. Okay, and they had like one record that was like reissued, an album that was reissued a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, he that's his background. Yeah, he moved into town, and uh, we actually formed it here. Uh, we didn't have a bass player, and then uh, Chrome Cranks moved up to uh, New York. I moved, and then Pete. Uh, moved up with me, uh, but yeah, we're we got a band called Stabbing Jabs together now, and uh, I think uh, some label in France is going to put the record out, and uh, they have distribution worldwide. But I think we're going to do our own U.S. distribution and find somebody to put that out. It's uh just cranked up like Detroit sounding rock, you know, which is kind of his vocal forte, <laughs> screaming that's and stuff. Me, so. Man, Stabbing Jabs, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh it's it's all, you know, uh really good stuff, I think. And yeah, it's outside like you know, currently in town here in Cincinnati, I am playing in like six bands, <laughs> not really doing much, playing out much with them, but you know, rehearsing well, and well, stuff like that. For those who don't know, what what in a, just in a nutshell, what was mm -hmm. the history of what was the history of like years of the Chrome Cranks? Uh like I said, we we did start out in Cincinnati. I think we played two gigs. Um and then I moved to New York in 91, and within months, I hooked up with Gigi and Sugar Shock. Uh, then Pete moved up here in, like, sometime spring of uh, 92. And, well, what, uh, year did, year did Chrome Cranks actually start? 
Uh, that would be, I think, maybe 89. Okay, know, so you're a couple of years, a few years. Yeah, there was a single, uh, uh, a bunch of singles of local bands that was put out by Out of District, out of Chicago. And uh, we got, uh, we had like a really bad, you know, like four track set recording, but the guy used it. And, uh, you know, so that's, you know, we were, I guess that came out in 90, 91 or something like that. And uh, so that's, you know, I moved up there and told Pete, you know, man, don't be like the big fish in the small pond. Get your ass up here. And he, he used to do a lot of booking for uh, uh, some clubs here. And like, you know, all the big acts came through. Uh, and so he had a lot of friends in New York that, you know, uh, slept on his floor and stuff like that. And uh, so we hooked up with uh, Jerry Teal, Honeymoon Killers. And the Killers were just uh, breaking up at that point. Oh, I know and, Jerry. I know yeah, Jerry. Yeah, he was my so, pal. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, he uh, joined in on bass, and then uh, we went through a bunch of drummers. Um, uh, Charlie Hansen played on the first record, um, and then uh, we went through a couple other guys. Then Bob Burt wound up uh, being a sucker and uh, accepting the role. <laughs> so, and we were with him for I guess five, six years. First Bob broke, the drummer for Sonic Youth. Right, Sonic Youth, Pussy Galore. Um, he's uh, in a bunch of other bands right now. Wolf, uh, what's it, Wolf Manhattan. He's, yeah, you know, he was on the show not too long ago when he said, oh, okay. mm. the Wolf Manhattan Project album. I really like that stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he hooked up with uh, some good guys there. And, you know, Kid, he's a really nice guy. Um, so, yeah, we were together. So like maybe 98, just when we did a bunch of touring and I think, you know, I guess prolific for the five years that, uh, you know, the, the last lineup, uh, did, you know, we did like, uh, maybe three, four record, the live one, uh, double LP. That, that was really good. Anyway, uh, band broke up. Uh, I moved back to Cincinnati in 2000 and maybe I think 2010, um, we got an offer, even though the band had not been together for a while, uh, from uh, a festival in France. And uh, they offered to fly us over and put us up and all that stuff. So we, That's you know, awesome. sure. Yeah. So we got back together, did two rehearsals, flew over there. Uh, we booked some other gigs while we were over there just to fill some time. And, and you know, uh, and then uh, Pete had a bunch of songs and we rehearsed them. And then uh, I think I went back up maybe six months later we recorded them and then our uh our fourth studio record came out and uh, uh, <laughs> uh it has blood in the title i can't recall it right now um but uh you know that and, and that was like uh that got a lot of good reviews i don't know if it's sold or anything like that but uh no. yeah there's it, probably not going to be any more reunions just because you know stabbing jabs is, is what pete and i are are concentrating on well you know it's always i hate when people say the good old days because i believe the good old days are always right now it's like the reality that we're currently creating so i, don't, I never live in the past kind of guy uh -huh. but uh people do want to know man and they want to know like how did you initially and get hooked up with gg allen <laughs> uh like i said i moved up there and uh what was it um 98 98 uh that's like no maybe 99 early or i'm sorry uh 89 and uh oh wait shit i'm sorry 91 i moved up there in 91 and uh, a couple months after i got i wasn't planning on playing guitar you know even though i brought it and like then i got bored and hooked up with sugar shock uh was with them and then i saw an ad in village voice that i think chick and john put it in looking for a guitar uh, player that's the guy that you replaced yeah the guy re i replaced and uh so uh you know my roommate said oh man you ought to audition for that and i said well yeah might as well so i gave him a call um talked to merle and uh booked an audition went down there's like one college guy that was in front of me and i'm thinking there'd be a bunch of new york scuzz rockers there nobody except dd Dee Dee ramon was there <laughs> so uh that's another yeah. question i have for you yeah uh he was there for like maybe two three rehearsals the first one that that the audition i did uh uh Gigi wasn't in town so chick and john was singing in the uh, well that's a whole story on its own but then uh Can I ask you this? what, what uh, was your take on the what was your take on Dee, Dee man how did he act and stuff was he, he was, was, he he was really nice 
you know, you, you obviously have talked to him over the years, you know, when he was around and, uh, you know, how polite he can be and whatever. And, and he was like that. And, uh, but you know, he, he came in, he wanted to play guitar and, you know, the guy's written like, you know, the best songs in the world, but he couldn't even play bite it. You, you scum, man, you know, like four chords, <laughs> he couldn't get the rhythm down or anything. And it's just the same four chords over and over, you know, and he did that with every song. So, they said, okay, Weber here is a decent guitar player. He'll play, and we'll have just Dee Dee like, there also, but not turned up. And Dee Dee's like, well, I can just do uh, leads over everything. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty weird, man. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, you know, the day we went uh, to go on the road, you know, he, he was a no-show. <laughs> so was, I can't blame not gonna go. What do you think the deal was, man? What well, I think I think he was just like antsy and wanted to get on the road doing something with someone. And then like, you know, it came down, you know, wanted to get in. But then I think he talked to like a bunch of people like, man, you don't want to go out on the road with that <laughs> headache, you know. <laughs> so, oh, I wish they would have told me that. But uh, <laughs> Reality sets in, man. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, got, I got to keep it rolling. I got to ask uh, you, dude. I hate, I hate to be there. Kind of got to rush you, but I got to sure. get to the dirt, the juice, the, uh -huh. the gravy. <laughs> um you did three tours with Gigi Allen and the boys. Yeah. Uh, what, if you right now off the top of your head, what was one of the craziest things that you experienced? I would, you know, uh, definitely have to say uh, uh, San Antonio in 92. Um, yeah, there was supposed to be security there and all that stuff. And I think they had to grab somebody from the bar and there's like, tons of knives and a couple guns confiscated and these mexican gangs were like you know they wanted blood and uh we get out there and i i think maybe we went through six songs or something like that and that's where everybody attacked the stage attacked Gigi, broke his arm uh all this stuff and uh um, but then after the show, we're like all behind, like, you know, it wasn't even like a, a green room. It was just like a curtain <laughs> pulled up at the back of the of a hallway. And we're back at, oh, man, we're dead. We're dead. And I'm like, well, you know, let's go out. Just, you know, we got to confront it at some point. And everybody was there. And they're like, great show. They're all like, you know, <laughs> really enthusiastic. <laughs> and like, that was a fucking mess. You know, it's like, oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I thought, oh man, you know, two years or whatever. <laughs> so wow. uh, that was, that was the wildest one. You know? you know, when I was, when I was in San Antonio, one of the times where I had heard from the locals there about that show, it's absolutely legendary to the locals uh, there. Uh, what was it called? DMZ. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's around still or, or anything. Yeah, but, uh, I've, I've, I've never known well, anybody Joe, else to play there. Well, Joe <laughs> from the Cutthroats, uh, a friend of mine, he took me there and showed me where the event had happened and, and told me his take. He didn't get to go to the show, but he had heard it from all people a little bit older than him. And it's like this major folklore crazy show that happened. And <laughs> I had to ask you, man. And it's cool that you mentioned that one. Uh, another, like, just real quick, uh, the Antenna Club in, uh, was it Memphis? Um, we played the last show that they were having and uh, before the club closed. That's like a legendary, you know, uh, punk club, you know, a bunch of bands played through there. And uh, <laughs> Gigi uh, just was in his mode or whatever. And he started smashing, you know, some chairs. And uh, <laughs> pretty soon, like, he, he wouldn't stop. And the owner's just like, well, let him go, man, because we're out of here tomorrow anyway. And so he had this huge, like, pile of, of broken furniture in the center of the room and you know the owners didn't care i thought that was funny so <laughs> <laughs> now how did you guys get along did you and Gigi get along pretty good oh yeah yeah um i mean you know uh you know there's two modes of him you know there's a kevin and then there's Gigi, and you know i uh, hate to bust any you know, ideas people have about him but like you know he would just slip into Gigi once we we're you know out of the van in the van he was kevin you know and uh he turned me on to like really good old like old time country music and uh we always had like you know uh i i kind of knew he had you know well just talking uh that he grew up like you know in the 70s early 70s rock and stuff like that so we always had something to listen to that was along those lines and i had a couple garage 
compilation tapes and uh he loved those and uh he really liked flaming groovy so he's put that in and uh he loved that so it's like you know uh he was uh, you know a character put it that way you know and uh yeah we got along all the time you know except you know i think he was a uh, deep pants me on our last show in detroit <laughs> because <laughs> i i got uh i went out with a lady right before we were to play and like she drug me to this bar down the street and we did a bunch of shots and like i was late getting back and they were all on stage and of course i, I come back and i start stumbling <laughs> because everything started hitting and uh you know, <laughs> he was like, you know, that was a show where like he had a Bible and ripped it all up and put, you know, lighter fluid on it and set it on fire and all that stuff. And then he burned like a sub pop fl flag or like poster or something like that. <laughs> so, and that was 93 when all that stuff was like popping up. Um, so, yeah, that's Gigi stuff. <laughs> Do you have a personal favorite uh, Gigi Allen period or album from his entire career? What's your favorite thing by him? Oh, um, you know, uh, of course, that Roar cassette. That's why I had to buy that, like, you know, the day that, uh, the audition. I bought it in the morning and figured out the songs to go, go to the audition for. Um, was, oh, I, uh, I yeah. titled that, man. I titled that. Oh, album. yeah. Hated. Cool, man. Yeah. It was, uh, that's a great, you know, that, that's got, like, the hits. You know, I guess, you know, without Jabber stuff that I know of, that I Michael recall. Board, you know, Michael Borg uh, yeah. was responsible for that coming out, and he actually gave me credit, thank God, for coming up with it. And then Gigi used it for a couple tours after that. Yeah. He in the Nation 1 and 2. But, right. um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't think I got to see the Murder Junkies with you. I think I saw them with Chicken John, or am I yeah. wrong? Did I meet um, you? I never met you, yeah. Uh, okay. That, That's I right. would re remember. <laughs> yeah, we had a falling out. Not a falling out. With more, I had a falling out with Merle, not Gigi. Oh, no, join I, the club, man. <laughs> I, never, I never, to my knowledge, me and Gigi never had any kind of falling out technically ever. Uh, uh, it was Merle. It was Merle that kind of drove a wedge between me and Gigi, and Gigi and I both got kind of stubborn and just kind of stopped talking. The last year and a half, he was alive. Yeah. But and then when uh, check it out, I called Merle when Gigi died because I wanted to you know talk to Merle and say I was sorry yeah. and find out what was up. And I said, Hey, are you going to have a you know a get together for friends and all that? And he goes, Yeah, for friends. <laughs> You know, uh, I just read yesterday, you might have seen it, that he had a uh, bicycle accident. And I, was got, gonna bring, I was going to bring that up because I yeah. heard you guys, don't, you guys don't talk anymore. Yeah, well, I sent him a text, you know, just, you know, I always reach out every, you know, his birthday and stuff like that. He never gets back. I'm, the, I'm you know, proud to say, or maybe not proud, but I'm the only, you know, uh, murder junkie from the GG lineup that's been fired three times. <laughs> Wow, what's the reason? Yeah. Oh, well, like uh the first time uh I didn't figure out his his you know the songs that you know post GG stuff uh until the day you know I got out to California to hook up for the tour and he just went belligerent on that. I don't know why. Uh we played two shows before I was fired and they were fine. Anyway, uh that started it. Uh and uh it's really weird. Um uh, you know, uh, he had the singer, one of the singers call up uh, about a year ago and, you know, they wanted to get me back in. But I had to audition. I had to send in a cassette of me playing along with the songs. <laughs> so he knew I I knew him. And so I, so I did that. You know, it's all distorted. And I find out he's listening to it. And the only way he can monitor stuff is through an iPhone. He doesn't have a stereo or a computer. He does everything on his iPhone. And he doesn't even have like you know, uh, a set of, uh, you know, ear earphones for it. I'm like, oh my God. He calls back and he's like, where are the solos? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, where are the solos? I, you know, I want the solos. You got to do this all again and put the solos in it. And, and you got till Monday. Now the tour was supposed to happen last summer, which it didn't, but you know, and this was like six months before the tour. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? You know, you don't think I could solo or whatever. It was just, and he gave me uh, the deadline of Monday to get it done. And uh, I just never got back. And then, uh, and then same thing. Uh, about six months ago, um, Francis had called me up and uh, it went through the same thing. <laughs> so it's, he's, he's, I don't know. What is he uh, 70 or something like that pushing 70 or you no know, um i the last time i talked to merle actually last time i 
had a lot of interaction with 2014. I flew out to San Antonio. A band flew me out, the Cutthroats, <clears throat> and they learned a set of my music and backed me up. And I actually opened for Merle because we had this huge falling out from like 90 to like then. Yeah. And I, my buddy said, hey, man, just come out and bury the hatchet. I said, okay, I'm not a guy to hold grudges anyway. So I, uh, I, I came there and just said, yeah, I'll, I'll open up for Merle if you guys back me up and are the band. Great. So mm -hmm. we did it and uh, it was cool, you know, and then he came uh, to Southern Oregon here a couple times. And uh, one of the times I went to one of the pre like get togethers, and I didn't go to the shows, but I did go see him uh, one of the times he was in town to say hi and stuff. But yeah, I hope he heals up from his bike wreck. I definitely yeah. wish him a bad, bad yeah. or anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't wish any Bill. Bill on him. You know, I, I, if he called me up today or whenever, I, I'd still be friends. I keep telling him that in text like, man, you know. Yeah. I don't hold any grudges, but he does. So, <laughs> you know, life's too freaking short, man. You know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Am, I, am I wrong, or did you put out a book? Um, uh, kind of putting one together. I've been in a couple publications where they like, you know, do little stories I've written, and uh, uh, um, a guy from uh, a band called the Spoets. I think they're North Carolina. He did a big comic, and there's a section in there of a story I had with the Chrome Cranks. It's all comic. You know, is is his drawing style is really, really cool. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, that just came out, I think, a couple months ago. So everyone needs to know that uh, you are listening to an interview with William Gilmore Weber at the Church of Rock radio show. Stabbing Jabs is his current music, and that's what's important. Great talking to you, my friend. Yeah. I really appreciate you making the time for me. No problem. I, you know, uh, I wish we would have met, man. We probably could have exchanged some good stories. <laughs> you know what? I'm still, you know, thank God there's a technology out there, and I've been exactly. talking to our and I want to say thanks to our mutual friend S.R. Woodward, who hooked yes. us up. Yeah, he's, uh, he's something else, man. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a really great guy, and I'd like yeah. to work with him in the future as well, man, so who knows <laughs> what will happen to you, you know? There you go. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> all right, man. Like, I wish you the very best, and then we'll keep in touch, all right? Sounds good. And uh, anybody interested, it's WilliamWeber.com. I got to get the promo in there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have asked anyway, brother. Sorry about that. Quite all right. WilliamWeber.com, one B in Weber. So <laughs> cool, man. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thanks, man. Rock on and stay young. <laughs> Will do. Take care.